And that brings us to uh, our ingredient deep dive for this episode, which is on the topic uh, yes. of new ingredients, uh, S7, which is a, a new nitric oxide boosting ingredient from uh, Futraceuticals, which is one of the uh, developers of new ingredients in the supplement industry. That Futraceuticals is one, Nutrition 21 is another, Compound Solutions is one. Um, mm-hmm. And S7, so it's a, it's a blend of all these phytochemicals from vegetables and fruits for the listeners that may not be aware and there's a a study published in humans that is claiming that it enhances nitric oxide production endogenous nitric oxide production by 230 percent um and so you and i were talking this back and forth that you know if it's a blend of all these antioxidants uh we've seen literature previously that high doses of things like vitamin c and vitamin e uh can blunt the uh beneficial hypertrophic adaptations that resistance training induces um, and so in your review of the literature, can you kind of walk us through what you've learned about S7 and what your thoughts are on it and the study? Well, in there's, itself? there's only that one, that one study that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, they've got the, the, the researchers, uh, what's the first name starts with an N, uh, let me see here. I've got the studies pulled up here on my computer. Nemzer? Um, Nemzer, yeah, they've done some other work with similar types of supplements uh, so what, when you're looking at a study like this, um, first you did a nice job of, it's only, a, I think, a total of a 50 milligram supplement. It's a blend of various polyphenols, mm-hmm. things that have a um, variety of actions. There's chlorogenic acids in there, There's which is in um, uh, coffee. There's EGCG, which is in green tea. What else do they have in there? Um, other than the yeah, catechins, right. anthocyanins. Mm-hmm. Uh, Curcumin, a small amount of curcumin. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Um, so these things are all have antioxidant actions. Uh, in this case, they measured um, that they are actually inhibiting some of the enzymes involved with producing free radicals like superoxide and re- other reactive oxygen species. Mm-hmm. Um, so they found in this case that that happened. Now that's a nice overarching global thing, free radicals cause cellular damage this particular study they looked they did a, took a blood sample capillary blood and they were looking at blood cells mm-hmm. so first thing you need to do when you look at a study of of any sort really is say who or what did they study were these rats were these mice were these humans was what tissue was this so blood is a, a type of connective tissue they're looking at the cells in this blood mm-hmm. blood actually like technically it's there's four tissue types in the body and and connective tissue is one of those in blood is one, one form of, of that connective tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, they also found that it reduced oxygen consumption by inhibiting mitochondrial oxygen consumption um, as well. There was a reduction in blood glucose levels. So w- what they did is they fed two different doses of this supplement. Uh, I think there's a 25 and a 50 milligram mm-hmm. dose with breakfast, with a standardized like bread-based breakfast, just a standard sort of they called it a standard breakfast. Not something I probably would have eaten, but uh, <laughs> it was what they gave their subjects. There was actually a reduction in blood glucose, um, and there was an increased antioxidant scavenging ability in the plasma. And they had various ways of, of measuring that that you know I'd have to dig in really deep to see what the um, the pluses and minuses are of those. But I think they're pretty well established um, biochemical assays. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, this is in these are blood cells. Um, which are different than muscle cells. Mm-hmm. There wasn't an exercise intervention here. There wasn't a performance intervention here. Um, what they found was a change in uh, basically antioxidant, which is a, a good thing, generally speaking. There was something that they said is that these were apparently healthy subjects, but the uh, antioxidant status of them, let's see if I can find the exact quote without looking through here. Um, the mean value of the examined subjects was in the range they're talking about. Um, actually, this was a bioavailable nitric oxide concentrations. The mean value of the examined subjects in the range of 26.4 plus or minus 6.7 nanometers. That's based on the, um, the way that they measure that. The values are not typical for healthy um, adults, but are in fact typical for the aged persons. So, they had an increase in a uh, twofold increase in circulating nitric oxide hemoglobin following the administration of both the 25 and 50 milligrams. So there was an increase in nitric oxide mm-hmm. in the blood in this scenario, 
in the tissue that they sampled. So what, so what I'm pointing at here is something I, that's known as external validity. Can what extent can we take these these findings and apply them to other situations. Mm -hmm. If we studied mice, does that apply to football players at University of Texas at Austin? <laughs> well, I mean, mice running a maze are different than football players, you know, running plays on the field trying mm -hmm. to score touchdowns. In this case, we've got blood, um, and there's obviously an effect there that these all these uh, ingredients in the supplement are known to have that kind of antioxidant action in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, some of them also elevate intracellularly um, by acting on the antioxidant response element genetically, the, the level of the enzymes that are involved with free radical quenching. So they literally have an effect in uh, increasing the cellular capacity for quenching um, free radicals. It's mm -hmm. um, scavenging ability. So that's not found or they measured here. I don't, I don't think at least maybe I missed it, but Basically, this is consistent with what you find with these ingredients, but not in skeletal, not in skeletal muscle and not with exercise, although it was with humans. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. It's a great start, but it's one study, and it's the type of thing, of course, that I imagine will go on ads. It, can, it, will, it will be a good way to put this ingredient into a, um, a supplement, a product of some, as, as sort of one of the key ingredients in some sort of a product. Um, so that's that's a big overarching look at what this study kind of tells us. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that you pointed out, and this is a big topic, I think maybe why you want, want to look at this, because it's something I've touched on before I mentioned in my book. Mm -hmm. um, I've written articles on it. Uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, actually N-acetylcysteine has the same effect. Right. Um, there's a resistance exercise study with the muscle, muscle, muscle damage and soreness. And one of the things that, um, is going on when we're stimulating adaptation in skeletal muscles. We're, we're applying the stress of the weight training. We're producing what ends up being damage to some degree. You don't want too much um, and inflammation. And part of that signaling process is through free radical production. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a, the studies with, with there's an animal study showing, um, I believe it was a uh, compensatory overload was, um, limited when they use, when they administer to these brats, they take out one of the plantar flexors, remember the study properly. And there was let, am I, am I with you? You're nodding your head. Like this is the study. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. So I don't know about humans as far as resistance training goes, but there definitely is as far as adaptations to endurance exercise in terms of mitochondrial biogenesis, mm -hmm. um, improvement in insulin sensitivity or glucose disposal. So something about the free radical stress is seems to be an essential ingredient in bringing about the adaptations to exercise. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of how the stress is signaled, and if we blunt this with literally what are megadoses, like a gram of vitamin C and you know hundred hundred IUs of vitamin D, that sort of thing, you can stop those things from happening. Mm -hmm. um, so the question then becomes, um, how much is a megadose? And how much uh, is too much? Um, and there's also this sort of falls into the idea of a hormetic response or, or the idea of hormesis, whereby some amount of what you would consider, consider toxicity or a toxic stress, mm -hmm. like what you could say a free radical is, will bring about adaptation. And, and there's an optimal amount. And then there's what is too much. Right. So you can actually... Um, uh, I mean, radiation will do this sort of thing. You can actually produce hormetic stresses with radiation. Radiation is not good for cells in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you get you get the same thing with UV radiation. You'll bring about adaptation. If there's too much, this is an easy sort of notion to hold on to, is if there's too much radi uh, UV radiation, you go out and you get sunburned. Mm -hmm. That's not good. You'll get scarred. But if you have a, a good amount, then you'll have a nice tan um, develop. If you're out, if you just stick your head out in the sun and you come right back in, unless you're a vampire, you're not going to get enough to have anything happen. So that's, that's at the low end. Right. So you've got this inverse, inverse you scenario where eventually you can go bad or you get so much of a stimulus with this toxic mm -hmm. um, or hermetic stress that you actually have a maladaptation. Yeah. That would be sort of overtraining um, in the sense of, uh, of an exercise adaptation or something that causes a decrement performance or would actually literally cause, in the case of muscle size, maybe even a, a reduction in muscle size or loss of strength 
Mm -hmm. um, because you just did did too much. Imagine you go in the gym and you try to do one of those asinine workouts I talked about. <laughs> 98 sets on legs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or the, you know, the cybergenics and you're basically on train. You would have – rhabdo would be the, would probably what might happen to you. You would be a happy camper for quite a while. Mm -hmm. you, may, you wouldn't come back. They've actually done muscle soreness studies in older folks and found there's shifts in MRI contrast that last for, for months. Mm -hmm. um, and older folks are more uh, amenable to muscle damage. They're probably – they're highly sedentary in many cases. Maybe a function of the aged muscle, just the fact that they're, they've been inactive. So – Back to this supplement, then. It's a very, very small amount, mm -hmm. and this study doesn't really point to how this particular blend would be affecting cell muscle. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I'm, I, I'm waiting for, I haven't looked, it's been about a half a year, a year, but there is a, there's a categorical difference between taking in vitamin C, which in and of itself um, is an antioxidant, mm -hmm. and taking in... Um, nutraceuticals or plant-derived compounds, the things like the EGCG, the corrigenic acids, curcumin, et cetera, mm -hmm. that tends to inhibit free radical production or elevate enzymes of free radical quenching. Mm -hmm. Because that basically is feeding in to the molecular machinery of the cell mm -hmm. to improve its ability to quench the free radicals that would be produced with any type of stimulus, inflammation, muscle stress like exercise that produces damage and inflammation thereafter mm -hmm. so that's the thing that um, I'm interested to see is whether like if you were to take a group of individuals and you maybe do a crossover a study um, basically designed so that you you, um, you increase by supplementing over a long period of time the cellular especially in skeletal muscle not blood per se because that's nice to know but Skeletal muscle biopsy is a little bit different than taking a capillary blood sample. Right. A little more in-depth procedure, different tissue type, et cetera. And to what extent would that then help the, the cell better manage that inflammation and that stress and maybe even have a better adaptive capacity? Mm -hmm. Are you increasing in some way the cellular resources to manage the stress of exercise so that you don't – so you maybe optimize it in some way? I, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. I really am not even sure. Um, because you can obviously produce more stress by doing more exercise. Right. So if you undertrain, so to speak, you don't get the optimal amount of training volume or training stimulus. Mm -hmm. Um, if you do too much, then you've gone too far. Um, one thing you can do with something like a vitamin C or vitamin E, and I've actually mentioned this before. I knew some powerlifters who would have days where they just go bonkers. They wanted to train really hard. And do lots of high effort, max effort reps in a way that would be just destro destroy them mm -hmm. um, muscularly. They'll take like NSAIDs, load up on aspirin, and they'll go in and have a crazy day. Mm -hmm. And they get stimulus for the nervous system. They get to practice all these singles and doubles and triples. Yeah. And the NSAIDs keep them from being broken down that they can't train only the next week. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you're, you're able to re you, you, you could use something like an NSAID in this case, or if we're talking about antioxidants to shift you from a point where you're too far over in terms of the stimulus back to where you have sort of an optimal stress to, okay. to maximize your adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's with like just the blunt administration of like vitamin E or vitamin C and cysteine, so that it is that quantum free radicals in and of itself. That's a different question here with what we're talking about with, with phytochemicals, phytonutrients, because now you're feeding, as I said, you're feeding into the cellular cell cell's ability to quench those things, mm -hmm. and that you would seem would think is a healthy thing, unless um, it makes it such that that you, this, you do end up dampening the stimulus. Um, because the interesting thing is, it's and now you're making me think about this actually in a new way. I hadn't planned on going here, but I'm going to just just go with it because it seems to make sense. Is that really what we're doing with 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 muscle with with um, Resistance exercise, trying to increase muscle size, mm -hmm. as you've heard me say this a million times, it's kind of an unnatural act. Yeah. We're, we're producing a muscular callus, um, and the muscle adapts to that, um, mm -hmm. but it's a very odd thing to pick the weight up and up and down repeatedly. We're exploiting those molecular mechanisms to increase muscle size, mm -hmm. and if, and I'm just speculating here, if you then have somehow made the, artificially or through through supplementation of these phytochemicals in a way that you 
I mean, how much green tea would you have to drink and how much um, uh, of various herbs and spices would you have to take in in order to match what you could do with some of these supplements? Right. Uh, have you now increased that free radical quenching ability in sort of an unnatural way such that the cell is, is so able to cope with that free radical component of the stimulus for muscle growth that you now, you now basically give the cell another option mm -hmm. to just simply quench and, and, and get rid of the, the, the stress in that way, as opposed to growing more muscle mass, increasing the contractile material and becoming stronger, which also reduces the stress. Right. If you're bigger and stronger, picking up 100 pounds isn't nearly as tough mm -hmm. as it was a year before when you weren't as strong. If you've got greater free radical quenching ability in the muscle because you've super supplement, so to speak, with these sorts of herbs and spices in a way that you would have a hard time doing maybe, mm -hmm. I'd have to see, like, look at the equivalency to know. But if you've done that, maybe then um, the cell, the cellular machinery, the, the evolutionary wisdom of the molecular machinery is able to say, you know, we can actually handle and resist this stress simply because now we've got the capacity to quench mm -hmm. the free radicals and prevent that damage from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. It'd almost be, and this is, this is maybe a stretch too, but almost be, um, and this might be even easier for folks to understand, imagine if you could like come up with like a, a, a retroviral vector that would transfect into skeletal muscle uh, a gene that produces a cycle oxygenase inhibiting um, chemical. Mm -hmm. So basically something that would do just the same as an NSAID. So now you've basically enhanced your muscles with non anti-inflammatory <laughs> capacity. You are blunt, you blunt all the normal things that are set in motion. Mm -hmm. that, in a way, I mean, it's an odd analogy, but you see where I'm going. That's sort of what you could maybe do right. if you were to take in a lot of these things. But I don't know. I really don't know. And that's, that's a total hole in my, um, I'm sure people who, who study this, and this is what their careers are about, probably know that there's some limit um, mm -hmm. to the extent you, you, to which you can upregulate these enzymes and inhibit them. Then mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, taking in, you know, massive amounts of a supplement like this won't have that effect. But I haven't seen anyone do that. I have to see the, um, the data to see if there's, as I suspect, a categorical difference between vitamin C and vitamin E and, and acetylcysteine and things of that nature. Right. And phytonutrients which have a really very very different mechanism of quenching free radicals mm -hmm. so yeah those are my thoughts on this on this the singular study which um which is cool it's a good starting spot but that's what i um that's what i'm thinking about it as of this point yeah and then one of the other things is that this was also done in people with metabolic syndrome so would these same would a healthy individual would it have greater uh, capacity to boost nitric oxide? Would it be dampened since, you know, maybe this is counteracting some of the inflammation and other things that are going haywire in people with metabolic syndrome to where this would be more effective if you are sick and if not as effective if you're healthy? Um, and then or, it could be the instance also of that maybe this is boosting your ability to perform, but it's going to hinder muscle growth for all the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms that you touched on earlier. Um, to where you're robbing Peter to play Paul in one instance to where, yeah, I can perform better, similar to what you're saying when you're taking a massive dose of NSAIDs, but, you know, on the back end, you're not going to get as much of a, a growth or training stimulus, but you were able to just perform better. So it's, that I'd like to see some exercise studies on this, and I'm also just, this is the inner skeptic in me in that the dose is so low and you're getting such a massive, you know, potential increase in nitric oxide. When have we ever, ever seen a compound outside of certain special sports supplements that you can take such a minute dose of and have such astronomical results. So that's, that's um, another thing that's in my inner skeptic. So. Yeah, well, this is just in the blood. So this is where that was, you know, I don't know. Uh, um, there may be different ways in which um, each of these phytonutrients make their way into the blood. Mm -hmm. and they didn't me measure, you know, what was actually getting in to what extent. Right. Um, it may be that some of those things never even made their way into the blood. <laughs> they got some really minute amounts of some of those things. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, curcumin. Curcumin is very poorly bioavailable. I don't know if the, the one point, there's like 1.2 or something like that milligrams of curcumin. I don't know if that, you know, made its way in there whatsoever. So we don't really even know what's actively 
um, affecting their results here because they that they didn't measure blood levels. I don't believe of any of the um, the compounds. So Correct. the presumption, of course, is that something in the S seven is making its way in, mm-hmm. um, but it's just affecting um, what they're measuring there in the blood sample. Right. Um, and so this is not uh, in a situation where you've got an exercise stress that's turning on nitric oxide release, et cetera, et cetera. And it, you know, it's very, it's, um, it's interesting. You've got like scenarios where once you've got a stimulus of exercise, that's, um, that really is, it's quintessential to survival, being able to fight or fly, so to speak, is you've got like an example that pops to mind is, um, no matter really what you has going on nutritionally in terms of glucose availability, when you're exercising at high intensity, your glycogen um, use is going to be pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. If you've got a high intensity exercise situation, glycogenolysis rates um, proceed according to the energy demand of the exercise because glycogen is going to be your main fuel right. aside from creatine, phosphate, initially, and those sorts of things. It's going to be the main fuel for anything lasting, you know, longer than about five or ten seconds up mm-hmm. to you know several minutes. So the cells are just set up to do that. So if we've got an exercise situation where you have to have increased blood flow into the skeletal muscle, which can it, blood flow can increase tremendously in skeletal muscle. Mm-hmm. Actually, much, much more. The increase in skeletal muscle blood flow is about three to four times um, what the heart could provide on the whole to the whole body at once. So cardiac output can go, you know, can go up you know, maybe six fold or something like that in a highly trained endurance athlete from like five liters per minute to like 30. Um, but if you measure, yeah, so that's a, that's a really impressive. Most people it's more like four to, four fold, like five to 20, mm-hmm. but, uh, uh, someone with a big heart can do that. But if you look at the skeletal muscle in and of itself, you'd be like isolated exercise, which just like a knee extension type of thing. Mm-hmm. The increase in blood flow there is tremendous. It's way beyond if you were to do whole body exercise, it's way beyond what the heart could possibly provide. Right. Because skeletal muscle can do that. So the increase in blood flow in skeletal muscle um, is tremendous. Whether or not this small amount that has this effect just in the, on the blood cells would have any magnitude of appreciable effect on actual blood flow in skeletal muscle during high-intensity exercise when the blood flow can go up just tremendously mm-hmm. um, is actually a pretty, pretty dang good question. Um, I missed some of your first question. You were cutting out on my end. You were, they did study uh, healthy subjects here, you, but you said something about, if I'm reading this right, um, just looking at the abstract and then reading through in that quote that I read, they were, they were talking about, they, they, they called them healthy, but their, their levels of NO2 were more like the, those of older folks. So they, they picked out people who were apparently um, healthy, healthy human participants, N equals eight. Um, but you had a question, which is a good one, I think, anyway, but I didn't catch it because the, the feed was a little, little wobbly on my end. Um, I thought I had remembered reading something about it. Some, certain some of the subjects had metabolic syndrome. So I'm wondering if it's because they've got certain underlying issues. Is that what is making the boost in NO uh, more successful than if they were completely healthy and didn't have any underlying symptoms of metabolic syndrome? Mm. That's a that's a good question. Um, think this through a little bit. And there, are, you know, there are certain sort of courses with people who have metabolic syndrome. It's not. It is largely, you know, it fits along with sedentary living mm-hmm. and the standard American diet, which may not include enough fruits and vegetables, right. which may not include enough phytonutrients. So. I'd be willing to bet if I dug in the literature, I wouldn't be surprised, let's say it this way, if I dug in the literature and you looked at uh, antioxidant status of people with metabolic syndrome, that mm-hmm. it is probably poorer than healthy folks. Right. And you probably trace that back to diet. So if, if the, these folks may have been more responsive to these, to the, at least their blood, <laughs> yeah. the blood cells of these individuals, it, who if they had metabolic syndrome, because basically they were their diets were deficient in these things, mm-hmm. so they whatever whatever was turning on, whatever about these compounds that was t- turning on or inhibiting or having these effects, um, probably would have been uh, of greater magnitude in someone who wasn't taking in these types of phytonutrients. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would I would bet for sure. Yeah. And that's that's pretty true. It's like if you uh, you take someone who's pretty healthy and you put them on a healthy diet, well, you won't see much change in their health. 
You take right. someone who's not very healthy and they're not eating a healthy diet, put them on a healthy diet, you'll see a bigger change. So, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree with what you're thinking. Yeah, and bouncing off what you just said, that, that's that's why I'm always surprised when these studies come out and then you see the the you know the attention grabbing headlines that your multivitamin doesn't work. I'm thinking, what do you expect from the multivitamin? It's just supposed to you know fill up any of these little holes in the gap. It's not going to turn you into Hercules Superman or make you drop 50 pounds. I mean, what do you you got to have realistic expectations for what you're supplementing with? Yes, yeah. So this is, I mean, this is interesting. I don't know. You know better than I do. I know there there's all a variety of sort of um specialized supplements like this one they put together a very small amount they've got they've shown an effect here mm -hmm. without a doubt there is a statistically significant effect um i don't know that like i said you're going to see an ad where people are going to you know make it clear that we tested the blood of healthy subjects and we saw this and there's no exercise they will give you the the, the headline increases improves antioxidant status mm -hmm. you know or quenches free radicals or something along those lines that's what that's what this literature for the FDA, you're supposed to have some sort of um, uh, mechanistic data to support your claims, although it doesn't happen most of the time. Did you see the report? It's, it's been several years ago now where the FDA kind of did a self audit mm -hmm. on products. Um, I can send this to you if you like. And yeah, I absolutely. think they went in and they just picked out like 79, something like that products. And they, they, they went back and looked at the substantiation mm -hmm. that had been put forth um, for the label claims mm -hmm. and literally none of them met the criteria the FDA had set out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so you, have you seen this? It was, like, yeah, I mean, we get, they, we get some of these studies every couple of months. Uh, Dr. Peter Cohen, who's uh, with over at, uh, Harvard university has mm -hmm. done two reports within the past year and a half, both on, uh, different pre-workouts and stimulants in there. And each time he's tested them, and I mean, he's just going and grabbing them off the store at like a GNC or something. So, I mean, there could be various QA, QC issues with the, uh, the transport and you, you, there's, you could definitely poke holes in the study, but basically only two of like the 10 or 12 products he's looking at have, uh, the actual amounts of stimulants in there that they're claiming on the label. Some of them are two or three times higher. Some of them are two or three times lower. So it's, there's, there are, massive oversights within the industry in regards to quality control with some of these brands. And this was, and that's of course, that's been an issue for forever. I mean, then there's of course tainting with, with yeah. illegal sports supplements and those sorts of things, supplements. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, this was a function of looking at the substantiation for label claims, oh, not necessarily yeah. testing the, the testing, how well they tested out mm -hmm. when you, um, when you did a, an analysis of uh, the contents and, and, and they were just, they were somehow they were feeding things through the FDA and they did a self audit and they looked at how well are we, do, we actually adhere making all these uh, manufacturers adhere to our mm -hmm. own requirements. And none of them were, they were like, yeah. like something like this, like this was, this one actually is a, a good study. I, I don't, I can't say for sure, but it was with human subjects. Mm -hmm. The claim would be increases antioxidant, improves antioxidant status. They've actually got some, they've actually got some substantiation there. Right. They can't say, you know, it, um, you know, improves exercise performance or quench, quenches free radicals to make you stronger and faster right. or something like that because those data aren't there. But but they've actually got something in human subjects, whereas some of the – if this were – this this could have been a um, like an in vitro study mm -hmm. um, and where they just like added it to, you know, some cell culture of some sort and looked at what happened there. Yeah. Kind of thing that would make it onto a, a lead plane in some way, shape, or form mm -hmm. that is not cool with the FDA if they're providing a supplement for human consumption that right. doesn't fit with what they're So they they don't do a very good job. So a lot of things that are out there are making claims that are just like they're not substantiated up to the FDA's standards, and the FDA is not paying attention to their own standards. At least as of a few years ago. So I'll send that to you. Remind me, and I'll um. I'll, uh, I'll email, email that study to you. Yeah, please do. And it's wow. my, my issue yeah. is that a lot of companies have already jumped on the bandwagon of this ingredient, and they've already started oh, sure. putting it in their products and advertising it. And if you go on the Futraceuticals website, I pulled it up. It says it's designed for use in products that target performance and muscle-building athletes, um, mm -hmm. those seeking products supported by clinical research, active lifestyle consumers. But none of the, the study didn't attest for any of those variables. So, you know, we weren't using – resistance training is one of the, the variables they weren't te testing any kind of exercise protocol um and then it says the benefits are it's plant-based which is a you know one of those trigger words these days it's you know one of those eye-catching ones small dose clinically tested and then increases no by 230 so it's 
And then it says applications, of course, pre-workout, muscle pump, and yeah. So it's uh, – yeah. I'm not sold Maybe on it yet. Maybe something we're missing. Is, is there another study somewhere? I, I didn't know one, but – No, this okay. is the only one that's been published to date. Okay. Yeah. I hate to say because you never know. Sometimes, like you say, there's no other studies, but maybe there is. But I think you're right. I, I looked. I didn't yeah. see there was nothing on the website that I could see. So, yeah, that's um, you know what it kind of comes down to is what can people claim, right? You know, and people just want to claim whatever sells. It doesn't. The truth of, of the matter doesn't really make a difference Correct. um when it comes to the truth of the money that can be gained in selling the product. Yeah. So. Um, you know, it's funny because I've had a little bit of interaction too, and I've, um, I'm not going to provide all the context, but there have been times when I've gotten a hold of the researchers because mm-hmm. um, I've seen things and I want to like kind of know, and I've actually contacted the researchers and said, you know, can you tell me like this is what is being said about this product? And when I read your abstract and I look in, in your in your paper, the data don't don't match. Mm-hmm. They don't substantiate that notion. Um, was something like, or sometimes the abstract will say something different than what the, the paper actually says. And right. I'm like, was this just a typo or what's going on? Can you tell me what, what you actually found here? Here's my, my question. And the times I've done that, it's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't remember. I, we don't have the data anymore or something like that. It's, um, you know, and I think maybe those are honest, mm-hmm. could be honest answers. I'm not saying someone's lying to me, but, um, those sorts of things happen. There's mm-hmm. all sorts of, uh, of, uh, sort of misinformation that can be projected forth. Like in this case, it seems like misinformation. I, you know, don't get myself in legal trouble, but it sounds like they're, from what you read there, they're definitely overstepping um, what, what I would call external validity. To what degree can we externalize these these findings yeah. to other scenarios like exercise, resistance right. training, or what have you? doesn't seem to be there. Right. So I'm glad you're doing this podcast in this way. This is like, this is one of I, you know, it has been for years when I was back when I was a research, when I was doing research, mm-hmm. I was at a college position just for a couple of years. And that was one of the things I wanted to do was like dig in and basically shoot holes in some of the claims. I wanted to like single handedly be like, you know, the, the, uh, the sheriff out there in the wild, wild <laughs> West industry, just start shooting all the bad guys with yeah. research. You know, t- that's why I studied creatine, you mm-hmm. know, just like, at the time, I even I remember I had done my master's thesis on creatine. It was starting to take hold, and um, my uh, doctoral advisor, I mentioned, you know, what I had done, and and he didn't know the literature as well as I did at that time, mm-hmm. but he knew it just come about, and and he was he's like, okay, you know, let's see here, like this is, mm-hmm. you know, he was very 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 skeptical about it, and obviously it's panned out pretty well as far as creatine goes, but, right? Um, yeah, there's so much bamboozling out there. There's so much to be done, and. It's a shame. I don't want to say like there's a there's a catch twenty two. A lot of labs have to support further research. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like you um you know rob Peter to pay Paul. I guess as they say. So you do some research that brings some money to the lab, so you can do other research you consider more meaningful. And you know that those data, although you just you've done your due diligence mm-hmm. as an honest academician in putting forth that information. As you see it in the literature, you, re- you read the paper. I don't think they overstepped their bounds anywhere as far as conclusions. No, 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 they didn't. Someone else doing that, you know? Right, right. So it's like you, you know, you're feeding. It's you know, it's kind of like um, I don't want to go into political issue here, but like it's sort of like you if you work at a, a gun store and someone has every right to buy bullets, and you have the sense this guy's going to do something really bad with these bullets, yeah, or this gun. Like you're like. I, I, I'm not killing anybody, but I have a sense like I, if I had my choice, I wouldn't give him this. So I wonder if those researchers, I'm literally providing ammunition here mm-hmm. for people to sell things in a way. And who knows? May, maybe this will pan out to have some ergogenic effect. Who are we to know? I don't know. Right. We don't. Right. I mean, we really don't know. Maybe it's possible, you know, but I think your skepticism is warranted. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I sure wish um, the supplement industry were a little more um, at least kind of upfront. I will say that, you know, I want to say dishonest, but upfront and saying, this is what we know, not like designed for this. It's like, oh, what do you, how can you possibly say that? Yeah. It, was, it, was, it hasn't been tested in that populations, much less, you know, an ergogenic, uh, you know, test of any sort. So exactly. Yeah. That's a great topic. I'm, this, this, I'm glad you, this is a perfect, this is like a quintessential example of what happens a lot. Oh yeah. Um, I oh, think, yeah. yeah, you know, 
Yeah, well, it's, it's 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 an all too common story in the in the supplement industry, and that's you know the main reason I got into here was you know to try to help separate the truth from the BS because there's so much garbage fed to consumers, and if I can just save one person you know one thirty dollar bottle from wasting it on a product that's not going to do jack squat for them, you know then that makes my day. So it's mm-hmm. it's one of those things. So it's yeah. I'd love to see more research from the, the lab or you know from Futraceuticals on the ingredient. I'm just not mm-hmm. sold on it yet. Yeah, so. yeah. I hear it's. I mean, it's interesting. Did you see um, where and how they came up with the formulation? What the rationale was for putting those things together in that way? No, I have not. They they have a, a another ingredient called Spectra Seven, which is another blend of phytochemicals from a bunch of fruits and vegetables. Um, so I'm wondering if they just uh, right maybe refined it a little bit more for certain. Um, redox signaling compounds and other things that enhance the antioxidant capacity of cells. Um, I think that may be at play. I'm just not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. The, it, I don't, I, it's called, I found one called spectra. Yeah. That's the, seven, the but, older brother of this. One. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. And that one has, it's a full spectrum antioxidant product, proprietary combination. And that has a boatload of stuff. That has the whole kitchen sink in it. <coughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe they did. Um, there probably was some pilot work that maybe they didn't mention. Mm-hmm. You know, where they found they can, you know, they can whittle this down to the smallest amount to get some sort of a, a statistically significant or a substantial effect. Um, the real question is. Um, and this is always the kind of the question with, with science and this came up in the podcast, it'll come up, came up a couple of days ago when we did that podcast, it'll continue to come up is mm-hmm. the difference between statistical significance and practical significance. Exactly. Does it really matter? And that's connected to the external validity. So mm-hmm. yeah, it increased, you know, um, nitric oxide production in blood cells. Um, but you know, unless you're going to go at the beginning of a race, and do a blood draw and hand them a, you know, a venipuncture tube. <laughs> um, and that's going to help you win the race. It doesn't matter. Right. It needs to make you faster or stronger or, or be able to jump higher, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with this. But I imagine, I mean, th- that's the thing. It's like it's almost, I hate to say it, it's sort of a, it's a misuse of science. And we can be easily blinded by it. Mm-hmm. You know, it didn't used to be like back in like 20 years ago could say whatever you want, you know, and oh, they yeah. have like all these fake graphs. And now we've got legitimate science that's being used. And that's a, just another way to sort of to um, bamboozle people in many ways. Because mm-hmm. you literally, I mean, an average person trying to pick up this paper and read, like, I don't know what most of those assays were they're doing. I'd have to go and look at the reference methods. Mm-hmm. I could eventually tease it out, but I didn't want to spend 20 hours doing that. It was immaterial for the purpose of this podcast. Right. But it's like, it's, it's just Greek mm-hmm. or Latin <laughs> to most people. It's just crazy. <laughs> So um, you just kind of nod your head. You read the abstract if you go that deep, and it's um, it's a shame because uh, I think if you use and I have this in my book. If you look and and just look at the big things, they were healthy volunteers, mm-hmm. like you said. Was there any exercise? No. Was it muscle? No. I'm worried about muscle. No. Okay. It was blood. Well, that's not quite the same, is it? No. A like common sense, just spending literally about 15 seconds, mm-hmm. and you can get a really good handle on. The external validity, the practical applicability of this study. Um, the question will be whether they actually cite it when you see those ads. Because, and for people who don't know, if you're online or on your phone or what have you, you can literally just swipe an entire reference starting from the first author, first author's name to the page number and paste that into Google or go to scholar.google.com and you'll find the abstract almost 90% of the time at least. Yep. You can find those papers. So you can read the abstracts and get so like, okay, that was bullshit. That was in mice. That was in cell culture. It wasn't in people. They weren't resistance trained, etc. So you can do that. You mm-hmm. can actually, with um, literally about 30 seconds of your time, get a really good handle just with common sense and no scientific background as to whether they're trying to sneak something in as really – substantial applicable science or if it's just um just a way to add some bells and whistles to an ad so exactly yeah 
Yeah, and that's the the last point I'll make on this before I, I beat this any further into the ground is that a lot of the times the, the companies aren't selling this ingredient as a standalone so people can understand what it's doing. It's it's packaged in with citrulline and or nitrates and or a cell volumizing ingredient like taurine or glycerol or uh, creatine, right. betaine, some of those kind of things. So it's, you know, with, how much of, of, of your muscle pumps from this pump pre-workout are really attributable to S7 and how much of it is to the other 16 things that are in there? It's just... Mm-hmm. So it's it's yeah you know, it's another soapbox I'll I'll jump on on another day I'm sure <laughs> it's a, it's a big one I, that's why like I, I could go in the other room and show you like when I, where I have my creatine I have beta alanine I have citrulline I have I have, I get this stuff from True Nutrition I'm not trying to plug them but they're just a good source and you get certificates of quality certificates of analysis from them and I add my own ingredients it's cheaper mm-hmm. I don't mind doing that I I got the Mad Scientist gene so I like mm-hmm. to kind of make my own concoctions. But that's the way to know. And if you find something works, it's unfortunate. A lot of times, what are pretty good products? They vanish. They go away. Yeah. So if you're someone who's planning on bodybuilding, um, especially if you're a competitor and you want to use something on a consistent basis and you can get the individual ingredients, um, there's nothing worse. And I've seen this happen. Like, let's say like back in the day when, um, we had like some of like uh, uh, some of the fat burners that like hydroxy cut was mm-hmm. an example. Remember that, yep. and that worked pretty well from what I remember. Yeah, but and then it, I remember that it's like all of a sudden they changed the formulation. It's like you can't get the good stuff anymore. Yeah. It's like well, shoot. So people like that was a key ingredient in the fat loss stack for for many people back mm-hmm. in the day. And so like a sub uh, some sort of supplement with all these ingredients that you might add that in and find that it works. And then it vanishes, and you don't know what worked and right. why. So if you can come up with the basic ingredients, and then you know what it is, like, okay, I lost my source of beta alanine, I can go find that elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm, I'm big on not having the proprietary blends and all, so many things together that have overlapping actions. Correct. Yeah. Pl- plus, like, when it comes – like that's a, this is a small amount. It's 25 or 50 milligrams, mm-hmm. but I've seen people, too, who – they will take in, they will use everything, like they will use all of the ingredients in what are the clinically evidenced doses for right. each of them. And now you've got overkill. Like yeah. you're, you're feeding into the same mechanism from everywhere. It's like, it's like, do we really need to like pour water from the pitcher and turn on the sprinkler while it's raining in order to water our grass? Like the rain's fine. We don't need to do it from all angles. You're just, all you do is flooding things out mm-hmm. and potentially creating hepatic toxicity. For instance, as well. So, yep. Um, anyway, there, that, that is a whole other topic. Maybe for a, a later podcast, we can go into that one. Absolutely, uh, Doctor Scott. Thank you so much for uh, this. I've kept you on for an hour and a half. This has lasted longer than I imagined, but it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you for being so generous with your time. This was outstanding, Absolutely. and we'd love to have you back uh, at some point down the road to discuss well, some other. We can get on a couple of other soapboxes with regards to the industry or something. There's lots of them. We'll just leapfrog from soapbox to soapbox. Sounds good. Um, where can thanks for doing what you do? Before I go into that, like what you're doing is very very cool. I mean, I th- this is like this is one of my major pushes is to try to like um, increase intellectual honesty, increase you know knowledge, smart consumerism, and you're doing this in a phenomenal way. So I'm I'm happy that you're you're part of the industry. Thank you're you very much. Fight. Yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate it. Um, you mentioned several times uh, the the podcast with Paul Carter and Alan Aragon, the the Swole Trinity. When can we expect that to to land in iTunes and all the other podcast apps? Oh, God. it was actually you can see the live podcast we did on Facebook right now. Yes, it's on my Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be just a few days. I think usually it's like four days for um. Mm-hmm. So we did it on Wednesday. I would, by, by guess by probably next Monday. So today's. It's the 26th. Oh, definitely by the beginning of May, I would think. Fantastic. The very latest. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, those are going to be good. Alan's a really bright guy. Mm-hmm. Paul is outspoken as all hell. He's having a blast. I think you watched it. <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of, uh, lots of uh, F-bombs and, uh-huh. you know, four-letter expletives. We sort of let mm-hmm. loose in a way different than what I did here. Obviously, I sort of – I don't hold myself back, but it's much more um, – uh, at least so far, we got a, some pretty high-energy uh, – um, bromancing going on with the three of us, so awesome. it's fun. But you know, all those those guys are just so bright. It's going to be a high quality and a lot of fun to do. So they definitely tune in for that. I don't know where we're going to go, but it's going to be good places, I think. 
Excellent. Um, I'll make sure to put a link to the, the live video of that in the show notes. Where else can uh, people find you at? Oh, all my websites lead to fortitudetraining.net, um, be your own bodybuilding coach.com or just byobbcoach.com. That's like my big brain dump. I'm trying to get folks um, tuned into. It's got information about hormesis and um, sort of general supplement um, categories and ergogenic aid some of the stuff I'm, I think, I'm guessing you probably have it mm -hmm. the book um so that's got my ideas on supplements being at the top of that nutritional hierarchy of importance right and then instagram i'm an instagram i was a reluctant instagram adopter but i'm on instagram mm -hmm. at fortitude underscore training and then um you can just type in scott stevenson bodybuilding or scott stevenson meathead and you'll you'll find me pretty easily <laughs> so not hard to find Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Scott, for this, and uh, have a fantastic well, weekend. Yeah, you too, brother. Appreciate it, man. All right.